turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians this morning, and we're going to be looking at the last part of chapter 5 and then into chapter 6, as it has been some weeks since we were with you. Um, I want to try to bring you up to speed on the context of this chapter. Most of us have had a relationship that was once close, but no longer is. It's kind of a tough situation to perhaps have had a close friend who is no, no longer a close friend. Sometimes such a distancing is, is fairly easily explained. Sometimes it's as easily explainable as a, a job move to another state. The physical distance makes it difficult to maintain that closeness and one finds oneself just gradually drifting apart. Sometimes there's been an offense. There's been a hurt feeling or hurt feelings. And that has driven a wedge within that relationship. Sometimes breaches in relationship come from outside. Someone else has entered into the equation that has been toxic. They have come in and spoken ill, perhaps, of you to that person with whom you were once close. And then a wedge was driven into that relationship and the closeness that one experienced, one no longer does. If you can get a sense of that circumstance, that last situation, you will be able to relate to not only this passage that we're looking at this morning, but the entire book of 2 Corinthians. For the Apostle Paul and his colleagues had led people to Christ, to Jesus, in the city of Corinth, had established a church there, had a wonderfully close relationship with this body of believers as brothers and sisters in Christ. But after he had left, some other folks, other influences came in, toxic people, that they began, began to speak ill of the Apostle Paul. You may recall that he had told them in his first letter to the Corinthians that at some point he wanted to come and be with them once again. He had been away for quite some time. And he wanted to come back and minister to them, but circumstances had prevented that. He, he couldn't get back there. And that change in plans gave some toxic people within that assembly of believers the opportunity to attack him. They said things like, well, you sure can't trust what that guy says, can you? Said he was going to come, but then he didn't show up, did he? Not really honest, that guy, is he? Can't trust him. He's, he's kind, of a, kind of a poser, isn't he? Kind of insincere. Maybe you shouldn't listen to him anymore. That, my friend, is what happened. And the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is now writing these people to try to restore that same relationship that he had prior to these people interfering and injecting ill will into that body. So the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is trying to restore their confidence and their esteem, and he tells them in this section, verse 20 of chapter 5 on through chapter 6, verse 13, he tells them essentially three things. He tells them, number one, that they have been, he and his colleagues have been ambassadors for Christ representatives of Jesus to these people. 
and further that they had been co-workers, colleagues with Jesus for their benefit. And then thirdly, he tells them that they had been ministers of God serving with integrity. And understand that all of these things are things that these people had poisoned the minds of believers in regard that Paul really wasn't a sincere minister of God. He really wasn't a genuine article, and he was hypocritical. And Paul is telling them, no, we have been God's ambassadors to you. Now look at verse 20, and this is where we ended up with the narrative as as we are working our way through the book of 2 Corinthians. In verse 20, he says, Now then, we are ambassadors, representatives of Jesus for Christ. They were ambassadors. Now, what is an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who speaks for someone else, for another sovereign or for another nation. He doesn't represent it himself. He represents the one who has sent him. Paul says, this is what we are. We represent him. We are his mouthpiece. As though God did beseech you by us. As though God is speaking to you through us, by us. Be reconciled with God. They had a message from God to the Corinthians. Be reconciled with me, God says. For he... Verse 21, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is how folks are reconciled with God. I had a lady some years ago said that getting saved was simply asking forgiveness. I said, no, it's not. Getting saved is trusting personally in the one who takes your sin upon himself and then gives you his righteous standing. Trusting personally in Christ, turning from your sin, trusting the only one who can save you from the condemnation of your sin and then receiving the rightness, the righteousness of God in him. Righteous standing. That's how you're reconciled with God, accepted by virtue of our relationship with Jesus. This is the message that he says we are ambassadors for. This is our role, he says, ambassadors, representatives of Jesus to them. By the way, just before we leave that, so are you. If you know Christ as Savior, you are his ambassador to your workplace, to your neighborhood, to your family, to your school, to your friends. And when you share Christ, it is God speaking through you. They were the representatives of Jesus to them. Now, we've already covered all of this in depth in the previous message, but I want to go into chapter 6 now, because this is what he's saying. We are on the level. We are God's representatives, and he says we are God's colleagues with Jesus for them. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you. This phrase workers together with him is is four words right in English it's one word in the Greek it is a word that basically means co-laborers it would be the same word if we were all pulling on a rope trying to lift a heavy object and all those every one of those people pulling on that rope together would be this word this word that's used there in the Greek co-workers co-laborers colleagues And he says, this is what we are as well, as workers together with him. Paul is telling them that we are colleagues, co-workers with Jesus for them. Now, it's true that they were working for him, but it was not simply an employer-employee or master-slave relationship. It was a partnership. They and God working together for the purpose of bringing people to a saving relationship with God. 
and God had used them to reach the Corinthians. And this is what, this is what he's reminding them of. You and I are not working for God as much as we are working with him. And he is working through us. My brother-in-law some years ago, my my brother-in-law is a, I've got other brother-in-laws. I'm speaking of a particular one. I have a brother-in-law that's an auto mechanic. And he's also a committed believer, loves the Lord. And for many years ran this auto repair business. And he would pass out a card to people as he settled up. When, he, when they paid him, he would pass them a card. And on that card was written something to the effect, he says, I consider God and myself to be in business together. And whatever I do, I know reflects on him, and I want him to be thought of in high esteem. And if you're not satisfied, you bring your vehicle back and we'll make it right. He had the idea, he knew who he was and knew that God's reputation and his were together because they were working together. Now, Paul says, this is us. And we who are co-workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Verse 1. Now remember, he tells them in verse 20 of chapter 5 that they are ambassadors telling them to be reconciled with God. How? Through Trusting the one who took their sin upon himself and imputes his righteousness. That's how you are reconciled. And then he tells them in verse 1 of chapter 6 that as God's partners, he has something else to tell them. And that is not to receive the grace that was given through the person work of Christ. Not to receive that in vain. And then he quotes in verse 2 a passage from the book of Isaiah, chapter 49 and verse 8. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In other words, that passage in Isaiah talks about acting upon what God has said. And what he is saying here, do not receive the grace of God in vain. Act upon the grace of God in your life. The grace that you've received through the person and work of Jesus for you. Now, why does he tell them that? He's telling them because this, because he does not want all of the work and all of the progress that they have made to be wasted. That's what it means to be in vain. Now, here's, I'm going to tell you a shocker. You ready? Prepare yourselves, okay? I don't want anybody to fall out of their pew. God does not save a person in order for that person to go to heaven. That's not the purpose of why God saves a person. That is a consequence. Being with Jesus forever and ever, that is a consequence of it. But God saves a person to become a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ so that their lives might glorify him. That is why the Great Commission in Matthew says, Go ye in all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, uh, and, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. God's purpose is for you to be transformed, to be like his son, in order to glorify him. And when that work is stifled, inhibited, contradicted, God's grace is not working in you that for which its purpose was designed. That If that does not happen, then the grace of God is is in vain. This is what Paul is saying. Now, you parents, if you're a parent or a wannabe parent someday, um, think of this, that you invest, say, 20 years 
in your young person. You've fed them, you've clothed them, you've taught them, you've, maybe you've invested, maybe you've gotten music lessons for them, you've educated them, you've tried to teach them, you know, the proper table decorum, you know, you, you try to teach them manners, you try to teach them to be good citizens, And then someone comes along who influences them in a way that's taking them the opposite way of, what, of how you trained them. Now think, think of that scenario. Paul is writing to people in whom he has invested the message of Christ, the grace of Christ, and the person work of Christ, but then also taught them in order to get them on a pathway that they would serve Christ. And he says, I am writing you, I am begging you. That is what the word beseech means. I'm begging you, don't receive God's grace in vain. They cared about the work of God in them. Paul says, God and and us did something together in you. Now don't make all this work be for nothing. So they were representatives of Jesus to them. They were colleagues with Jesus for them. But there's a third third thing, and this begins actually in verse 3 and goes through verse 13. So we're going to really go very, very quickly. So, you know, try to keep up, all right? The third thing he tells them, and keep in mind, in an effort to restore this relationship, is that they were ministers of God with integrity. Now notice in verse 3, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. These two verses are connected. He says, first of all, that they cared about the ministry, giving no offense in anything. They cared about the reputation of the ministry. They didn't want the ministry to be disgraced. I hope you care about that. I hope you care about that in your own personal testimony that you wouldn't do anything that is going to disgrace Christ. That you care about that. That you're not going to... I mean, all of us know that we are very flawed people and that we we mess up on a regular basis. We all know that. But at the same time, we know that there are certain there are certain behaviors and lifestyles that disgrace the testimony of the grace of God in our lives. And Paul says there are things in the ministry that we don't want to do anything that that impugns or disgraces the ministry, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Many of you have heard of churches where scandal has broken out. Some of you are too young to remember um, the PTL club scandal. Some of you are old enough that you wish you could forget it. (laughs) Um, Just to refresh your memory, there there was a televangelist by the name of Jim Baker and his wife Tammy Faye that um, operated a ministry and really fleeced that ministry for personal wealth and personal fame. Jim Baker got involved in immorality. Uh, Funds had been misused. These people lived in absolute luxury. They had gold-plated faucets in their bathroom. They even had an air-conditioned doghouse for their, their pooch. It was outrageous waste. Outrageous. And the news, the news had a field day. They hurt the ministry. About that time, another scandal broke out with a TV preacher by the name of Jimmy Swaggart. And some of you may be upset I'm naming names, but the point being is, I mean, it was, it was a, a, a graphic illustration of how the ministry is impacted when these kinds of things happen. And of course, things happen on a smaller scale. I I remember uh, when I was in graduate school, there was a pastor that had gotten word. He was was down in school for six weeks, and 
while he was down in, in graduate school, he got word that his church treasurer that had, had worked, uh, had done their books for decades, had been embezzling funds for decades. And he was just, he was absolutely devastated. Not simply by the funds that were, were taken, but he said, I remember him saying, he said, I would have trusted that woman with my life. The ministry gets blamed when these kinds of things happen. When things are not done openly, when things are not done properly. Paul says, we will not, do not want to give an offense in anything in order that the ministry would not be blamed. They cared about the ministry. Why did he care about the ministry? Because he was a minister of God. Notice in verse 4, he says, but in all things, approving ourselves of, as the ministers of God. Now, what follows? Our credentials. The credentials for somebody who's supposed to be in it for ministry's sake and not for personal sake. And by the way, it, this does not just apply to those who are vocationally called to ministry. This really would apply to, to you in your personal ministry, your personal walk and serving of the Lord. He begins to say, these are the things that prove that we are the ministers of God. And then he's used, he uses the first three words he says, in much patience. Did you catch this? This is not simply talking about waiting patiently. Uh, it's difficult enough to wait. But this patience has to do with keeping on, even though the keeping on may become very hard. That, that's this word that's used here. And it, he attaches this word in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. In other words, what Paul is saying here, he says this, this, this credential, this very first credential is perseverance in the face of negative circumstances. It's, it's what it takes to stop you. Now, I've met some folks that it doesn't take, it doesn't take a whole lot to stop them. I mean, they, they just, I'm, I'm not talking necessarily in the Christian life, but just in anything, if they encounter difficulties, they, they, are, they give up very, very easily. One of the markers of somebody in ministry for God Someone who knows the Lord, wants to serve the Lord. One of the markers is, is that they are serving him in the face of negative circumstances. They keep on keeping on. People going into ministry don't do it because it's going to increase their comfort level. Don't choose ministry if you want to live high on the proverbial hog. It's not going to happen. Paul says in much Patience, and then he uses the word afflictions, and that has to do with physical discomfort, being cold or perhaps hungry or perhaps thirsty, in necessities having to do with material things, stuff. If, if having things means a lot to you, do not go into the ministry. If you have to have lots of dough to live, don't choose a ministry. Afflictions, necessities, in distresses. In the Greek, it literally means narrow places. In other words, you're getting squeezed. <laughs> you ever been in a, and we even use it, I'm in a tight spot. We use that, that, that terminology. This is that terminology. I'm in a tight spot, a narrow place. That's this word in distresses. You're getting squeezed. This is one of the criteria. There was an old preacher. He's with the Lord now. He's been gone for probably 30 years now. But I remember him saying he was always glad when a young man out of his church became a pastor because he said that the young man's parents always became very supportive after their little boy started having to deal with the problems. <laughs> 
Paul is, says, in all patience. Someone said the test of your character is what it takes to stop you. What does it take to stop you? Listen, commitment to Christ has within that context a commitment to keep going even when it gets rough. Perseverance in the face of negative circumstances. But then he names something else in verse 5. He says, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults. That means, that means acceptance of personal risk. Stripes means beatings, in case you're wondering. It means getting, being willing to be beat. In tumults, or excuse me, in imprisonments, that's exactly what it is. It's prison. Now, I've never been a resident. I've been a visitor in, in prisons and in jails. I was a jail chaplain for a while, and I would go into the jail usually in the morning, and I would stay through lunch and into the afternoon. I would do ministry, several different kinds of ministry, sometimes personal counseling, sometimes two or three uh, uh, chapel services. There was never a day that I walked out of that jail and, and wasn't glad. Some people say, you know, concerning places, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. It's not a nice place to visit. Being locked up is a terrible situation. And he says, I've been in prison, imprisonments. There are places in this world that Christians are getting locked up. It may come to that here. (laughs) We don't know yet. He says, in imprisonments, in tumults. Tumults are riots. A while back, a Hindu mob attacked a missionary who was traveling with his family. The mob set fire to his car. And as his family tried to get out of the car, they beat them back into the car. And they burned to death. There are, there are missionaries that have been kidnapped kidnapped and held for ransom by communists and terrorists. I remember, I didn't know this guy personally, uh, it's before my day, but I knew his son. Back in the early part of the last century, this fundamental Methodist preacher, Methodist preacher by the name of Bob Schuller, who had a radio ministry and it church in, uh, out in California and he preached and he got on the wrong side of mobsters in that community and they put out a hit squad on him and I say I knew his son that old fundamental men- minister had several sons and he knew that they were coming he got word that they were sending out a, a car and they had the machine guns and they were going to strafe his he said his son's out on the roof of his <laughs> on the roof of his house with shotguns for when they came by. Now, by the way, I don't recommend this, right? I just think it's funny, you know. But um, they came by. They were going to rub him out. That's, that's tumults. Paul says there's an element of personal risk. Now, I haven't experienced a lot of that. I've been threatened. I've been grabbed in reference to ministry. You know, a guy grabbed me once. Nothing much more came of that at the time. I had a guy once, an ex-con, put a note, a threatening note in the offering plate (laughs) directed for me. But I've not experienced what Paul's talking about. But up friend, we might. Are you willing to accept the personal risk? And then look in verse 5, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. The idea is, is that he had very strong work ethic, that this was part of the credential for ministry. Labors. In, 
in study and in praying and in and fastings, something we do not do enough of. Again, connected to prayer and probably associated with ongoing <coughs> persecution. But a very dedicated worth ethic. That's part of the credential that he lists, beginning in verse 4. All things approving ourselves. And I know I'm moving quickly here, but I want us to see the overall context. And then he says, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, and then he lists some other things. What's he talking about there? He's talking about godly Christian character. That's, that's the fourth credential for authenticity for ministry. Godly Christian character. These are things not so much that they would do so much as what, what is in their nature, in their person. He's not referring to what they did so much as what kind of character they displayed. And the idea being brought across is that part of the credentials they displayed for ministry was that they had a genuine walk with God. They were Christians not just in word but in character. Hence, the pureness that he's speaking of is the personal purity in their lifestyle. They were not preaching purity and then living immorally. They did not preach clean and live dirty. And then he says, by knowledge, this is a knowledge of God that is both intellectual and experiential. It was obvious that they knew God. And then he says, by long suffering, and the idea is that they were not easily offended or provoked. Paul was not a hothead. I have known of people in ministry that really have disqualified themselves because they have a really uh, triggered temper. Shouldn't be in ministry. This is what he says, by long suffering. The ministry is not a place for a hothead. And then he says, by kindness. By kindness. They had displayed genuine kindness to people. They were not nasty people. And then notice as he's listing these things, by the Holy Ghost, they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit, used of the Spirit. And then he says, by love, unfeigned. What does it mean to be unfeigned? Unfaked. It's not fake. It's genuine. Real, genuine caring, not fabricated or artificial. And then he says, by the word of truth, what was spoken was true and came from God. By the power of God, God's power and working was evident in their life. By the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. What's he talking about there? He says they were equipped to cope with any attack, whether it came from the left or the right. The idea is that they were capable to adequately deal with the threats that presented themselves. Paul is saying, we have evidenced this in our character before you Corinthians. But then notice this in verse 8. And quickly, we're going to go through this. By honor and dishonor by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, by, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful and yet rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. What is, what's he doing there? Well, in, in verses 8 and 9, he's talking about being indifferent to the opinions of men by honor and dishonor. It's not about us and our personal honor by evil report and good report. It's not about what people say about us. As deceivers, being called deceivers and yet we're true, we're being accused falsely as unknown and yet well-known. The idea is, is that it does not matter what anybody thinks of us. It only matters what God thinks in our relationship and our walk with him. There are always going to be people who will doubt your integrity, who will question your motives or doubt your sincerity, and you can't worry about them or spend your time trying to prove yourselves to them. They will always be there, and when you're gone, they'll put their gun sights on someone else. Take comfort in the fact that they did it before to someone else, and they'll do it again to others who come after you, but ultimately, they do not matter. Whether famous or in the right circles or not. Opinion polls. Don't matter to them. 
It always astounds me when the news media acts so shocked when a politician ignores an opinion poll showing that people disagree with them, but if the same politician changes his position to go along with the opinion polls, they scorn him as not having a backbone. But opinion polls don't matter because there's only one opinion that matters. There was an old preacher, again, another one uh, that influenced my life, who's now with the Lord. He told me years ago, he said, just preach and let the chips fall where they may. Look at verses 9 and 10. As dying and behold, we live as chastened and not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. What's he talking about there? He's talking about this life, this life that is bittersweet. It's a bittersweet life. As dying and behold, we live. We're living under the threat of death, living like we are under judgment, yet we live on. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, taking on a life that involves a lot of grief and being glad to do it. As poor, yet making many rich. We don't possess worldly riches, but being able to give spiritual wealth to others. As having nothing and yet possessing everything. As being poor and, at the, and rich at the same time. This is, it's a contradiction. It's bittersweet. Sounds like, it sounds like he's contradicting himself, doesn't it? No, he's just saying this life of ministry is bittersweet. But they had embraced it. Folks, that is the nature of the Christian life. That is the nature of ministry. It's bittersweet. If you embrace the life that, that, that lives for Christ, you're going to hurt at times. You're going to have disappointment. You're going to have sorrow. You open yourself for wounds from other people. And yet there are riches in embracing that. Because you invest your life, you make sacrifices, you may get hurt, you may get wounded, you may be spent, but the dividends revealed are in fruit for the master and blessing in other people's lives. It's bittersweet. So, he lists all of these things. These are the credentials for ministry, but they're credentials for you and I as well. They persevered in the face of negative circumstances, accepted the threat that ministry involves, worked long and hard, displayed godly character, immune from the opinions of men, embraced a bittersweet existence. And he's telling them that so that they would make the comparison to the people who are making the accusations. Have they done that? And then he speaks from the heart to these people that he had led to Christ in verse 11 through 13. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. You are not straightened in us, but you're straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Now, folks, when I read that in the King James, quite honestly, that's, that is very hard for me to understand. And I love the King James. But it is not the way we talk today. Our mouth is opened unto you, our heart is enlarged. I don't know about you, but an enlarged heart is not, that doesn't bring about positive things to me. Um, our, our, you are straightened in your own bowels. That doesn't, that doesn't sound positive to me either. But in the language of the 17th century, what he's talking about there. Is the way in, in, in it would be more like this. We have spoken freely to you. We have opened wide our hearts to you. We have shared ourselves freely to you, but you have closed us off. It's not fair. I'm speaking to you as if you were my own children. Don't shut us out. Don't turn off the faucet of your affection toward us. Don't shut us out. You ever had someone shut you out? If it was someone close to you that did it, then you know what hurting is all about when you've been shut out. It's hard. Maybe it was one of your kids, maybe a brother or a sister, maybe someone who had been your closest friend and suddenly they've shut you out. Build up a wall and won't let you in. You might be thinking, yeah, I know someone like that. I'm experiencing that right now. How do I make them bring the wall down? 
You know what the answer to that question is? You don't. You can't make them bring the wall down. You can't control them. But what you can do is be absolutely authentic and absolutely vulnerable. You can make it very plain to them that you would have the relationship restored. You can't manipulate them, but you can be genuine. You can keep the walls down in yourself. Sometimes people, sometimes people harden themselves. And they shut off their emotions. They pull into a cocoon for one reason or another. And sometimes it's because someone has poisoned their minds against someone else, as here in this book of the Bible. Sometimes they shut themselves off because someone hurt them and they were resolved never to be hurt again. You can resolve that that's not going to be you. You can't control that in someone else, but you can resolve it's not going to be you. I remember a man in our home church in Ohio, a good man, but a man who had been hurt in a church problem. People had hurt him. And I remember him saying, I will never again serve on a church board. And he decided he would never be hurt again. But ministry friend and vulnerability to wounding go together. Sadly, he had shut himself off from people to protect his own heart. The problem is, is that when you shut yourself off for whatever reason, you may protect yourself, you may think you're protecting yourself, but you're also preventing yourself from ministry to others. Ministry and the possibility of getting hurt go together. You open your heart up for ministry, you also open yourself up for people to stab you if they choose to do that. But what you're saying is, I agree to accept the risk. It's part of the credential. You make yourself vulnerable to attack, but friend, don't put a wall up because the same wall that you put up to keep others out keeps you in. You will never be effective as a witness for Christ. So the only question is, is whether you will embrace the bittersweet life. Will you? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the passion that is expressed here. We know how easy it is to be hurt by others. But we also know that that is part of what you've called us to. And so I pray, Father, that you would work in the life of each individual here. And I pray that if there is a situation in their lives, in any of these folks' lives, where someone has shut them out and hurt them, I pray that you would resolve that situation, that, Lord, that you would take that and, and restore that relationship. But moreover, Lord, I pray that you would change, you would change each of us individually so that we would not be the people putting those walls up, but that we would be the people pleading to take the walls down. I pray that you do a transforming work in each one of the lives here represented here. And I ask God that you would work even in this moment of quietness as we are before you.